great show for you today. Crystal, what do we have? <laughs> what is this? Breaking points? Burning? Burning what? We're going to do the show that, that uh, Breaking Points should be. Breaking points. Um, the problem with Breaking Points. All right. With John Stewart. No. <laughs> Nobody knows what Breaking Points is. You should know about the problem. About, of course they do. Who knows? Who knows? You're one of the most popular. I mean, Bernie Sanders went on the show. How are you guys doing? My name is Peter Hartman here with Tom Hartman for Jumpstart Live. We're going to be talking about the fourth turning, Golden Age or Apocalypse. Now, I know what you're thinking. Some of you are thinking, what's the fourth turning? I've got you covered. In fact, I'll do you one better. I could tell you everything about the fourth turning, but I'm going to let Tom take this because, you know, I'm just, I'm magnanimous like that. <laughs> Tom, what the hell? First of all, how are you doing? And what the hell is the fourth turning? And why are we talking about this? Go. No, 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 Peter. I'm not coming here for a little chit chat, okay? What I, how I'm doing <laughs> is that I'm obsessed over this idea over the fourth turning, right? The fourth turning by William Strauss and Neil Howe, um, the late William Strauss and the uh, not late Neil Howe, who wrote a book that to me has completely changed the way that I uh, that I think about uh, parenting and children and the future and what the, our impact on the world. Basically, to boil it down, the idea of the fourth turning is based on the idea of uh, a human lifespan as a unit of time. So you can think of uh, someone grown up from, if you think of 20 year increments, you could think of someone in the first 20 years of their life, they have one type of experience, and then in the next 20, then in the next 20, and then the next 20. And these four different periods, uh, which usually comprise one whole lifetime, uh, which could uh, span between 80 years and 100 years, is, um, is four complete turnings. And so the interesting part is that what they, say, what they talk about in the book is this idea that when you were born and the, the, the people, the, um, the generations that were there before you and the generations that come after you influence the, um, the state, influence the different types of turnings that you're in. So a great way of explaining this is sort of like, imagine a, uh, a country, a country is founded, let's say the United States is founded, right? Declaration of Independence. And the, the country's founded in 1776. Well, that that generation had to fight, let's say, a battle against the uh, the British, and they had to, uh, you know, take up arms and uh, and th they had something to fight, right? So they they fight, they complete this war, they they succeed, but you can imagine that at that time there's three other types of people who are alive, right? They're the people who are fighting, but then they're the children who are too young to be in any fight, who are observing what's going on with. Um, these these heroes who are fighting, you have the uh, midlife generations who are too old to fight, and they are sort of like in the uh, in the um, uh, positions of power. Then you have the uh, elders, the seniors who are way too old to fight. Who um, they have you know memory of what was before, and they're sort of giving counsel to the the younger generations. And so that's that would be let's say one turning. And then after that point, if uh, the uh, the conflict is resolved, then you get into this to this next twenty year cycle where the heroes move up, and they're no longer the young adults uh, who are fighting a war. They're now the people who are in charge, and they're setting up the new systems and the new structures and the new infrastructures that people rely on. And their kids are now moving up into young adulthood, but they don't have a war to fight. Right, they're dealing with other things, and the the seniors they're they're dead, and the people who were the midlifers before who were in charge are now the seniors, and the cycle continues until it um, until everyone goes through the different stages of their of the the period of their life, and what's interesting about this is that the uh, the behavior that the different generations will that uh, exhibit exhibit will influence the younger generations in a predictable way so much so that by the time that the the heroes of the uh, of the crisis die we're going to be on the verge of another crisis <laughs> because it's just enough time for everybody who remembered what led up to the last crisis to be gone that memory just comes out and then um, and because those people who were in power, sort of like, uh, you know, the, the heroes who got older, the uh, um, uh, 
the, the people who move through these different cycles, they then become the problem and they sow the seeds of their own, of the next crisis. They don't even necessarily see it that the heroes from the, the previous crisis help sow the seeds for the next crisis. And so um, as they leave, they die off and then a new generation of heroes are born. They don't know that they're heroes yet, but their kids at the time that their civilization is, is crumbling in some way. And then when they come into a young adulthood, boom, there's a new crisis for them to, uh, to, to fight. And so the, uh, in the book, they call these 20-year cycles turnings. Now, I would say 20-year cycles. It could, it, it could vary. But the idea is from, from, from childhood, from birth to parenthood, from parenthood to grandparenthood, from grandparenthood to senior, and then God. Move the microphone just a, a little bit away from your mouth. All right. I like this idea of generations. From what I remember in the book, this, this cycling seems to be more acute in United States because they're landlocked, right? It's not like in Europe. It's not like in other parts of the world. They're landlocked. So this generational cycle happens more sort of tightly and more clear cut. So I, uh, this book is very sort of U.S. centric. Right, it's, it's it's focused on the United States, but um, it's a very interesting phenomenon that you would expect to be reproduced historically in other parts of the world. Tom, do you think it'd be a good idea? Do you think it'd be allowed to just read the the back of the book, the synopsis of it? Is sure. is that appropriate? Yeah. So don't forget uh, to move the microphone a little further from your mouth. Here we go. Good. First came the post-war high, then the awakening of the 60s and 70s, and now the unraveling. This audacious and provocative book tells us what to expect just beyond the start of the next century. Are you ready for the fourth turning? Strauss and Howe will change the way you see the world and your place in it. In the fourth turning, they apply their generational theories to the cycles of history and locate America in the middle of an unraveling period and on the brink of crisis. How you prepare for this crisis, the fourth turning, is intimately connected to the mood and attitude of your particular generation. Are you one of the can-do GI generation who triumphed in the last crisis? Do you belong to the uh, meditating silent, uh, the mediating silent majority who enjoyed the 1950s? Hi, sorry. Do you fall into the awakened boomer category of the 1970s and 1980s? Or are you a Gen Xer struggling to adapt to our splintering world? Whatever your stage of life, the fourth turning offers bold predictions about how all of us can prepare individually and collectively for America's next rendezvous with destiny. Ooh, sounds sounds tantalizing. Well, just I love uh, that. Make a comment on what you're I, I, I don't here, mean right? to to nitpick the audio thing. I just want to get down. Sam says you're a little low now, so just bring it a little too close. I hear it peaking a little, so that's what I'm trying to avoid. That's good. Yeah. So the idea here is that um, I, I'm, the, this book it didn't discover uh, turnings, right? Um, other civilizations have uh, come to the same conclusions. The The Romans would call them seculums. A seculum was this 20-year cycle, 20, 25-year cycle, where um, you're moving throughout the stages of life. And since life is this fractal structure, if we see ourselves as a unit – going through our own cycles of uh, from birth to death, it makes sense that collectively um, our whole generation is moving through that cycle and that our generations are interacting with the other generations in this beautiful resonance uh, uh, song where you have this predictable rhythms. You've heard the, the phrase that uh, history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes because it has a sort of cyclicality to it. And so uh, th this uh, sort of, uh, cyclicality happens wherever there's, there's uh, generations because it's based on the unit of a human life. What happens, though, is that in an empire, their sort of, um, uh, their sort of movements through these turnings can have effects through all their, the nation states that they, that they interact with. And we are in a unique situation right now. Uh, it seems to be the first time in our recorded history where we have an empire that's going through their turnings in a globalized system and it almost seems like it almost seems like the the Second World War, in one sense, synchronized 
the turnings throughout many different uh, nations, right? Hmm. The, 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 the Second World War ended up being a crisis that many different people had to uh, be involved with, many different populations. And so it, it has that, so it created a hero generation. And then those heroes interact with their children and their elders in a specific way. And as they grow up, they deal with different things. And so this fourth turning that we're dealing with right now, so the, the World War II was the last fourth turning. And now this fourth turning that we're seeing right now seems to be that we have the synchronization throughout um, uh, throughout many different countries, many, many different countries. And so we're having like this mega fourth turning where you can imagine that if uh, one of the predictions that they made in the 90s is that there would be a crisis that would be would spill out to be worldwide. And they said it could be a total war. But one of the things they suggested that could happen is a uh, a pandemic, that a pandemic might be the crisis because that sometimes is is the case, and they spelled out ex exactly what would happen. That a pandemic that happened during the fourth turning is different than a pandemic that happens in the first, second, or third turning. A pandemic that so you see in a first turning, this is after the previous crisis. So there's a high. They call this the high. The first turning is the high, where. It's this golden age period where where new ideas are uh, of how the world could could be rebuilt is put into place and uh, new technologies come into the plane and this is like this is revitalization of civic spirit and people um, have this trust in government because they help build and defend it and uh, it's this, it's this high flying period and then after that you can imagine that the trend gets a little bit too. What happens is that in the second turn, in which is called the awakening, the children of the um, uh, the, the the people who are coming of age in that time, they don't have a, a, a battle to fight, right? They the battle the battle is in recent memory; it's been fought, and so their concern moves from the external world to the internal world. They become more um, inwardly individualistic, more spiritually minded, and this is where spiritual revolutions often come. Uh, think of the uh, the 60s and 70s, the, the hippie movement. Think of new religions coming into play. Think of new ideologies. This happens within a uh, second turning. Then it gets to the point where there's excess in that in that state. And at, at that point, now the heroes are um, are in the what's called the unraveling, the third turning. The heroes are uh, the seniors. And they're they're out now of control in the state. They're more of uh, they're they're the people who are at the top of the chain, and the people who are in the awakening are are they they are fighting against the the man, the oppressors, the top, the heroes at the top. So man, the system hasn't changed, and you guys set it up, and now everything follows your rules. And people go, why should you have everything, and we shouldn't have everything? And you have this revolt, right? And then at the end of the unraveling, the the seeds of the next crisis are are building which is to say, it's not necessarily that it predicts what will happen. It, it predicts how people will react to it. So then the fourth turning comes, and it, it, when a crisis happens there, an event that's a crisis in the fourth turning is, not, again, it's not the same thing as a crisis that happens in the first, second, or third. This pandemic that we're, that we're in, if it happened during the high, we would have had the heroes who were fresh off of a previous battle, who were eager to, to tackle this, and faith in government would be, would be strong. If it happened during a um, a second turning, people would be so focused on the the spiritual aspect of it, right? Think of uh, man, we shouldn't we shouldn't fight, man. Um, uh, peace, not war. That sort of idea. Uh, within a third turning, people are so busy making money and taking advantage, and the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. That it, it's uh, in many states, it's a it's a good time that people are. We're not going to let something like a pandemic stop our party. Let's just deal with that and move on with what we're doing. But in the fourth turning where, the, you know, it feels like you, you can't get ahead, now you have a civil unrest and now you have um, uh, this contention within the, the population and the, there's the, the group of have and have-nots, the young and the old, uh, and this, this, um, this, uh, this uh, the system has become rigid right? People can't remember the old system before, and this system feels like it needs to be changed. And it, it makes sense that then the new heroes are born, and they grew up think, with this whole feedback mechanism that they're being prepared to be the new heroes of the new world. And so it's amazing to, to think that 
They go, these are the types of elements that um, are things that could cause a crisis. And this is the response the generation will have towards it, which is what we're seeing now. This is a fascinating. Uh, if you haven't read the book, definitely read the book. I mean, the book explains it in great detail. If you've heard terms like millennial, Gen X, boomers, all these terms came out of this book, right? Tom, if I'm right, they, they came out yeah, of you this. Pull up, uh, pull up the element I have there. So notice here, this is uh, uh, the, the idea of the, uh, the generational movement seen in the United States from uh, 1908 to, um, to question mark. And so you'll notice here, Peter, at the um, in parentheses are the names that the the authors of the fourth turning gave uh, these generations. So we have, uh, if you read from the at the bottom left, it's hero, artist, prophet, and nomad. So the in the um, in the Wait, first world war, uh, let, me, let me say that again. You have the hero, the artist, the prophet, and the nomad. These are the Got four. It names that they've given to these generations now there's it's so it's such a this pattern is such a um inbuilt fundamental thing that without really knowing it people have given names to whole generations that mm. reflect the spirit of that time so over here we have the gi generation those are the uh, the the soldiers who went off to the first world war and uh, when they were in childhood um in the uh, they they were children from the they were children at the uh, at the awakening, so there was the first world war that happened, and after that, that 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 soldier generation that would later on in the crisis in the um, for World War II go out to fight. They were children; they grow older. So you have the the let me actually can you see my mouse over here? Yeah. So you have the uh, you have the GI generation over here. Then it moves up, and they become the. Is there a reason this image is kind of blurry? It's low it's res. Scanned from a book. There's not a lot of. Uh, Gotcha. Example. Okay, go ahead. Don't worry about it. So then the, the heroes, when they enter young adulthood, this is where uh, Pearl Harbor happens. So Pearl Harbor happens. It catalyzes a, um, uh, a world war, and then they go off to war. And at that time, their, their children oh, – sorry, so let's just, let's just continue real quick here. So then after the, uh, the crisis occurs, you have the, the high, and here the, the, the soldier generations, they're in midlife, they're in control, and they're hubristic, right? I, I like focus on the hero generation because that's the generation we're in. And then later on, they move on to be uh, the, the powerful um, uh, seniors afterwards. And so you can see how the, the generations move diagonally throughout the different turnings. And there's always the new children who grow up and the, the old who are, who are dying off. It's a very, very interesting thing. So when we say boomers, the boomers here, so the, the boom down here, we have that's a prophet generation. So those are children of uh, those are some of the children from the hero generation who were indulged, right? They grew up. Um, they, their parents were in a. Uh, they grew up in a. They were children in a high, and so they got everything, right? They got everything handed to them. There's, even, there's more children at the time, they, and so they have this in, in, entitled nature. So when they when they moved off into uh, young adulthood, they became uh, more narcissistic. Now, this is not specific to boomers. This is specific to all children of uh, the heroes of a crisis. They exhibit this sort of narcissistic behavior because they think that when, when they, were, they were children, they were, they were told, well, you can have everything that you want. The world is your oyster. And then when they grow up, they go, well, I still want that. <laughs> and then, then they move off into midlife and they become moralistic. They, they, now they're in politics. Now they're the people who are in charge of making the rules. And they think, well, what they think is the the best thing to do because that's what they were told ever since they were children. And then now during the, um, uh, the fourth turning, we're going to be, we're going to have those boomers are now in elderhood, right? They're in the 60, 63 to 83 bracket. And they are um, like the previous prophets uh, during the, um, the world war two, they are now the, they're, they're supposed to be wiser in their adulthood where they see some of the mistakes in the past. They've lived enough life and they're supposed to be helping in, in a golden age scenario. They help the new heroes uh, fight the crisis. So it's actually very telling now that we, you know, we're calling this a uh, golden age or apocalypse. One of the things that, um, that suggests that one of the signs that we're going to move towards the golden age is when the boomers or when the, the prophet generation, the, the, the older generation work with the hero generation 
in order to solve the crisis. Because then you're using, you can imagine the the um, the experience of the of the boomers stretches further back than the heroes of the crisis, right? They have more knowledge of, but but the the heroes have um, energy and youth and a desire to risk themselves for uh, for the community. Um, one of the signs that you move towards an apocalypse is when you have a, when this uh, discord between the older generation and the newer generation. So when I hear people use the term OK Boomer now as a, <laughs> as, a, uh, as a pejorative term, that is a bad sign, Peter. That is a very, <laughs> very, very bad sign. Because we're not, we're not paying attention to the people who are wise, except they don't seem very wise, I'll no, tell you no. that. It, they're, they're, they're not seeming very wise. I mean, it's you might make the argument that it's justified that they're using that term as a pejorative, that they've earned that. But I'm just saying that's a problem because the heroes of our time now, the millennials, don't have the knowledge of the last 80 years. They only have their first sec- their first turning. One of the things that I'm inspired to do, uh, especially since COVID hit and it seemed to hit you know, the elderly even more, is I want to create... A, a show, a channel, I don't know what form it's going to take, but I'm calling it Elder Wisdom. And I want to hear from all of the older people, hey, like, what did you learn in life? What, what would you like to impart to the younger generation now? Boatloads of you are dying off by, uh, you know, in large numbers. You're not online as much where the young people are, so the conversation isn't really happening. So I want to encapsulate uh, I want to capture the wisdom, the elder wisdom that's out there and create sort of a flow, a channel where this information could be brought out because the people that I've always been the most interested in hearing from are older people. Everybody who's older than me, certainly people who are senior, I desperately want to learn from their mistakes and to stand on the shoulders of giants. Uh, I find it very funny because Melissa, my wife, was saying that we should do exactly that. She's like, you guys should invite those people on so that you can have that dialogue and um, and use their 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 knowledge to uh, to our benefit. Very fascinating you would say that, but better for you to do that than me because I find it more – well, this is the way that, that, that I'm thinking about it. I go, okay, so you, you want to you wanna expect the best plan for the worst. So if we're going to head towards a golden age, great then things are going to resolve itself in such a way. Because what happens is that the hero generation necessarily are uh, collectivists in nature, right? If you're going to sacrifice yourself for the group, you value the group over your, your, your own self, or you've expanded your definition to the group. And so we see a lot of millennials now, just like the, um, the, the soldiers of the, the GIs of the past, who favored uh, this uh, socialistic, communistic um, uh, breaking down of the divide between the rich and poor, um, mentality, which is healthy. You need that within within a system. But you need that to be tempered with those who grew up through individuality, who through, grew up through the awakening. And it's the balance between those two that then allows for, the, it, it gives the hero the ability to sacrifice themselves and think that know that they're sacrificing, putting themselves in danger for a good reason, for the group, but it doesn't, it doesn't get so out of control that it destroys the system, right? Um, but what happens is when there's a divide between the elder generation and the younger generation, well, the elder generation are so, they're trying to get theirs, right? Let me squeeze out another trillion for ourselves. And the young go, well, we got to blow this out. It's communism, socialism for all. And that is the only solution because look at what individuality and, and uh, capitalism and uh, the me, myself, and I mentality does. But both of them are bad, right? At the, at the, at the, you have the unraveling um, after the awakening because this, the, the trend towards individualism goes too far, right? And, but the, the, you can have the other side where the socialist, the communist, the collectivist, the authoritarianism gets too far too, which is what I worry that we, we, we might be headed to because we're not this finding is... an enemy that is um, we're finding uh, we're not finding a specific enemy yet. We're fighting an idea and there, because there's no collaboration between the old and young, we are sowing the seeds of our own destruction. So I'd rather think, think of while you speak to the elders, I'd rather uh, talk about how do we build the arc 
to get through the apocalypse of the fourth turning because one of the things that this makes me feel um, better about is that all systems change and die. That uh, I had a dream recently, Peter, where like I was worried, what what if we end up with a, an authoritarian government that takes over everything and it's it's uh, you know it's uh, it's uh, what if and concentration camps for everybody. And in my dream, the the uh, the the character, the shaman said, uh, "Okay, so name me an authoritarian government that has lasted through four turnings." I was like, uh, "That that is still, or not for the four turnings that's still around now." I was like, "Oh, I guess I can't really. I mean, I could name a few, but they weren't there for thousands and thousands of years." Because yeah, it all changes. It always goes up, and it's a, a cyclical process. So change is inevitable. So all if you're worried about a destruction then what you need is an arc to move through to the next what necessarily has to be a, uh the high the the uh at the post-crisis eras enter bitcoin that's exactly this is right. one of the reason i love talking about crypto from what i understand from the book the the hero generation they look around at the tools and the resources that are available to them in order to fashion a response a solution to the crisis that we're experiencing and what a time for crypto to rear its beautiful little head it's like part of the major problem is the economic system right whether you're socialist capitalist whatever you see a problem with the economic system and crypto bitcoin specifically but let's say the crypto space is allowing people to exit the decaying decrepit corrupted old financial system economic system into this new space which is i'm really hoping that this space stays to some degree pristine neutral empowering the individual not co-opted by institutions because this is the place i feel that the hero generation is going to be able to uh, build and create new things right when we talk about cryptocurrencies when we talked about this in previous videos it's not just about money it's the applications that are being created there's the solutions on all levels that are being created in the crypto space that technology is being used to build all kinds of things and that is desperately what we need the thing that i'm a little concerned about is that what i understood from the book or maybe it was from lectures was that this fourth turning is unlike other fourth turnings in that it is far more epic and vast and and impactful than any other fourth turning maybe it's because of what you said because we're in a more global society but the thing I'm worried about is that they say whoever wins this crisis, whatever philosophy, whatever people in charge win this crisis will actually reign for a long time after this. That the golden age or the apocalypse will last longer than other fourth turnings. Do I have that right? Yeah. So two things for that. The Because um, usually after the crisis, people go, well... Forget this back and forth thing. Uh, uh, we solved this crisis because of what we had. These heroes, let them set up whatever new systems they're going to set up. They have all the goodwill of the population. But you're right in that this fourth turning will be the fourth fourth turning of the United States. And um, it's coinciding with a what appears to be a global fourth turning. But what happens that is that what makes me optimistic, and I always prefer to really err on the optimistic side, even though I prepare for um, the the apocalypse the ending, is mm -hmm. that or the dystopian future is that um, you always see the seeds of the resolution of the crisis and the and the possibility of the golden age. You always see those seeds beforehand. It starts in the unraveling, percolates in the in the crisis, and then really comes onto play in the. Um, in the post-crisis, in the in the high, and when you take a look, this is what I find to be just so, ugh, just utterly mind blowing. So, in the '90s, they were predicting something's going to happen at the beginning of the next turning that's going to be a catalyst, and the catalyst is what ends the 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 unraveling and starts the uh, the, the fourth turning. And they, they go it's, in the book, they were like, eh, it's probably going to be something like a like a like a financial crisis. <clears throat> which is what happened. 2000, uh, 2008, 
financial crisis, global financial crisis, Peter. This is not just locally in the United States. This is not just a stock market crash of, of uh, 1929. This is a global, I mean, the entire economic system just completely faltered and changed. And what people don't actually understand, generally speaking, because they're not taught that, is that from that time, the entire economic system of the world actually has changed. Like, it's far more volatile and far more fragile and far more wobbly than it ever was before. There's all kinds of charts I can show you that shows this, that something's going on. Um, the particip participation rate of the of uh, the of labor is is low. People are out of money and still not going to work. This is before that, COVID. Well, no, this has started um, after two, uh, as of two thousand eight, after the housing crash. So it was just this weird thing. Even though the uh, stock market just kept going up and to the right, for some reason, people are like, "Why is the participation rate keep increasing?" Like. Why are more and more people? These are not people who are unemployed. These are decreasing, people who are right? sorry, decreasing participation rate is decreasing. Sorry, yes, yeah, so the participation is, is decreasing. Is that people are? These are not people who are unemployed. These are people who are so unemployed they go, "I'm not even looking for work. I'm out of the job force." So some of them are going on welfare. Some of them are just not doing it. Just finding side side things. They go, "I would rather not work. Something is going on." Um, pension funds and retirement funds are no longer generating um, the the percentage that they need in order to. People are paying into these pension funds thinking I'm going to get um, uh, seven to eleven percent per year on my money as I retire. They're struggling to get four or five percent. People have to sell the assets that they have. They can't live on the interest anymore. Something Social is Security going is going bankrupt. That's right. So uh, uh, there's this strange thing where a lot of financial system is crumbling. And then, just as that was happening, Bitcoin came in 2009, started in 2009. It started up and just percolated under, underground. And uh, so the, the seeds of the, of, um, the, of the tools that are needed for success and the seeds of the golden age, you always see before in the unraveling and in the, uh, and in the fourth turning. And so I go, okay, so when I take a look at these seeds, these are more than just um, there's a new political party that came on the scene, uh, you know, and and people are really, really, really digging these wigs or whatever it is. It's it's more than that. It's more than just just that. Um, oh, there's a new piece of technology. Even when we're talking about Bitcoin, oh, there's a new piece of technology that's happening. We are seeing revolution in uh, an exponential um, uh, explosion in technological innovation, the likes of which we've never seen. We're talking about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, but just as unbelievable things are happening in space travel, where we have billionaires shooting themselves into space. People go, oh, those billionaires shooting themselves into space. When has that ever happened? When has it ever happened where <laughs> billionaires are competing? And who, what, how are we going to get to space if not through the billionaires first? You think it was some poor guy who started, a, um, uh, built himself a boat out of wood that sailed to, uh, to, to the new world? <laughs> Oh, it was the rich people who sailed over there. And then, you know, people people come afterwards. So that's in space. Then at the same time, we're having this health revolution in technology where it's just uh, unbelievable the type of uh, uh, genome sequencing, the types of, I mean, people are going to inject now with a vaccine uh, that the type of vaccine, the mRNA, the, the mRNA vaccine, this technology didn't even exist before. Like, we don't even talk about that. Like, this is a brand new thing that made it so that a four-year vaccine can be done in a few months. Okay, so that's in the health space. Then within the um, uh, labor space, there is the automation of labor through uh, through machine and through AI that is uh, that is causing a complete reversal and re revolution in, in, uh, in labor and how people go about doing things. Now people could run entire multinational companies with three people in their bedroom. It's unbelievable. <laughs> So that's happening in that space. Then, and we're seeing it everywhere. We're seeing it in music. We're seeing it in food. We're seeing it in child. We're seeing it in education. So when I see this, these convergences all happening at the fourth turning, they weren't happening in the first, second, or third. They're converging right now like uh, just this unbelievable coincidence, the synchronicity, right at the biggest crisis our world has ever seen. Peter, if, right. an asteroid, if they told us yesterday, uh, tomorrow that an asteroid is about to hit Earth, I'd be like, that's right on par. Peter, <laughs> aliens, they're, they're talking right about aliens, time. for God's sakes. Uh, so this yeah, convergence the government... needs to be very optimistic because the, the, the system that needs to be in power, it can't be 
any small iteration of what the system that we have already. It has to be completely different, completely different. I'm talking about the way governments work, the way voting works, the way information dissem disseminated, the way money works, the way that information is processed, the, the way people, cho kids choose uh, jobs for the future. All of it changed. So I'm not worried that the Democrats or the Republicans are going to be in charge for the next 20 years because they don't know what's going on. None of us do. When COVID was happening, I thought, okay, COVID is going to be the crisis that's going to topple this whole thing. And so far, it hasn't, at least not directly. But what it has done is put an astronomical strain and disruption to the economic system so that the crash that I believe is coming is going to eclipse the 2008 financial crisis. This is going to control, I'll delete the whole shebang. Watching how the previous generation, the boomers or, you know, the people who are in charge right now, they're all, I mean, look how old Joe Biden is and Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump and all, uh, Nancy Pelosi. It's surprising how many old people still have their hands on the control of the machinery. And I don't think that at least the people in charge are the wisest people. I think there's elder wisdom out there. I don't think they're the wisest. And so normally what would happen from what I understand is that the millennials would have already now been taking control over the system. You know, the AOCs, the Andrew Yangs, the, the young innovators, they should have already been taking control of the system, but the older people are hanging on for dear life. Like, Tell the elderly that their social security is gonna is gone, like it's bankrupt. They don't want to hear anything about that. It's like plug in your ears and la la la, let's just go. So they're holding on to the system and the innovation isn't really happening there. So we thought that COVID was gonna tear things down, at least I did, but I really feel there's a crash that is yet to come to really put the pin in this uh to really blow up this fourth turning, to really cause the real big crisis. I know it feels like we're in crisis. To me, it feels like we're in a dire crisis right now. But now I'm hearing rumors of an upcoming crash. I don't know if this is true. I don't know if they're just trying to sell papers, but there's a financial crash. The consequence of COVID hasn't been felt yet. We're seeing supply chain um, strains that are happening. It's like the whole thing is teetering on the edge. And when it finally comes crashing down, if it weren't for crypto, I would have moved to Peru by now with gold in my back pocket. I mean, it seems like how the hell it's... It's the roadrunner where the coyote runs off the edge of the cliff and he's floating in the air, but because he hasn't looked down, he hasn't paid attention, he totally doesn't know how screwed he is yet. That's what it feels like in this world. So I wake up and there's all these problems with the, the vaccines and the government, and I go, well, hang on a second. I don't think we're really aware of the real problem that we're in. We're, there's no ground below our feet. And if we don't start grabbing these other solutions when it comes to crypto or AI or whatever, we're going to crash. It's going to go down. All so, right, so uh, I, I, I have a different opinion on that. So uh, just a smaller primer, uh, you can, you can, when you consider um, any type of prediction like this, when you th think of any type of... Uh, oh, wait, hang on. Just before your thing. Uh, wait, oh, shoot. This chat. Um, okay, spam. Okay, spam. Okay, let me let me let me block this user. Uh, webcam. Oh no no no! I'm sorry. I gotta I gotta block this. Sure, sure. Block this user. Can we delete these messages? Ew. Um, I'm sorry. I got distracted here because I just looked at the chat <laughs> and it ain't great. Okay, Ashley. Um. It is bad how many people have their hands on the controls. They have so little interest in the long term. Isn't that part and parcel with the boomer mentality to think of the now, forget the future, don't worry about the future, let me get mine now? 
Uh, yes, but let me let me let me uh, throw this at you. Okay, hang on. And then she also says, "I agree with Peter, which makes me extra right. The crisis <laughs> hasn't even come close to our arriving yet." Yeah, that's how I feel about it. That is definitely how I feel about it. Go ahead. So, uh, consider this one time. <laughs> you have <laughs> uh, compare a chaotic system to a cyclical system like a sine wave, to a linear system. So human beings were actually very bad at... First of all, if we live in a chaotic system, there's no point in anything. Anything can happen at any given time. Mm -hmm. There's always a, a level of uh, percolation, volatility, of chaos that, that can occur. But we certainly have a cyclical system. Like I was just telling you about the, the idea of uh, one human lifespan, uh, one, um, a human lifespan being a unit of time divided, divided into four for different turnings. Um, or so if once one part of a system is fractal, which is which is to say self similar, then the whole system must be fractal. And we see that we see that in changing of seasons. We see that in um, in trends and in, uh, in, in fashion and in music and foods or what have you. We have this sort of a cyclicality to it. All right. But what people do when they make pred predictions is that they always make as bad, even if they try not to, they make linear predictions. They because we can't help it, right? Ray Kurzweil talks about this. Our brains are designed for linear predictions. You yes. can count, oh, how many steps is it going to take for me to get to that rock versus the line getting to that rock? You can make that calculation. But how, if I give you a penny every day and doubled it every day for a month, how much money would you have at the end of that month? You can't make that. You can't make that calculation. That's right. And so what happens is that um, we think we're being very uh, wise by forecasting, but we're using a very small sample of our of our of our lives, even even of our memory, and extrapolating things way way up, right? It's way higher or way off from where it actually is. Mm -hmm. And so one of the one of the truths that come out through cyclicality is that whatever. The, the majority of people are predicting whatever is the consensus thing almost definitely will not happen. <laughs> it's almost definitely not that. Anyone who's ever traded stocks knows exactly that. It was going up this whole time. I bought it and it went down. It's, it's almost definitely going to go a different direction than what you think. All right. So, so what does that mean here? So you're talking about this idea that there might be a, a bigger crash coming. Well, the thing that is the most expected is that a great crash is coming. You know what's not expected? Wait. Not generally expected? I argue, if you watch Jim Cramer on CNBC, mm -hmm. you, who I use as my bellwether for what most people think, in the markets anyway, he, he thinks everything's rosy and what the hell is everybody worried about? Uh, no, they, they don't think it, they think it's rosy for the next uh, month or quarter. Jim Cramer doesn't talk a year from now. Oh. He always talks the next trading period. But the general consensus is that the general consensus every day is like, how is the stock market still making all time highs? It makes all time highs like every few days, few weeks. People are like, what is going on? <laughs> and people, uh, you, you see silly people who trade is like, oh man, just buy it and hold it, man. That's the best thing. I heard uh, Ben Shapiro say, oh, the best thing you can do is uh, uh, you just put your money in the, in the stock market and in an index fund and you compound your, your returns over the next 20 years. It's the smartest thing. It's the smartest thing to do. You know, uh, every, anytime there's a crash, don't worry about it. It always goes up. Yeah, that. <laughs> is like silly, silly, silly thinking. Um, <laughs> but uh, the idea that a crash is definitely going to come, like this crashes and then there's crashes that are like what you're talking about, the global financial crisis. Now, there will be that. There will be turmoil within the systems. Like we we're talking about how technology is affecting um, uh, all these different sectors. But the crash is not going to happen in the tech sector or in any of the sectors that, that tech is touching directly, those will skyrocket. I showed you the mm -hmm. chart of uh, Tesla the other day. It's that people are like, how is this company at a, more than $1,000 per share now? This company was at $50 just a few years ago. What is going on? It's going straight up, straight up, Peter. And a bunch of things are doing that. So there's parts of the markets that are exploding, right? And what I think is, is, not, is uh, not being discounted properly is this idea that the crypto space that we're talking about, one of the things that it does is that it allows things that were previously had locked value to be unlocked. Now, 
if we're going to talk about that the known value of our economic system um, in, in the world is, let's say, $23 trillion. I don't know the exact number. It's something like that. $23 trillion. That's $23 trillion of, of uh, liquid or near liquid assets. If you count the amount of value that, it would, that would, can be unlocked if it was monetized, it would be gajillions of dollars of value. In which case, you're not worried about a drop in the, in the stock market, that the stock market has dropped 80%. The amount of value that would be unlocked in people's lives would be insane. I was listening to this interview to, today. I forget the name, but it's not, not important. Uh, this idea that imagine um, the, 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 the space travel that they're doing, that they're able to, um, to mine asteroids for platinum and, uh, and uh, the different materials that, the, that they need. Well, what would happen to, let's say they're going to mine gold, right? What would happen to the gold price? The gold price would plummet. Absolutely. Because right? it would be a huge, a huge supply. But th that doesn't mean our quality of life went down. What it, meant is, what it means is that this thing that we want is now easier to get. What happens when um, uh, uh, education is uh, uh, tied into this crypto and now the, uh, the, 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 that information becomes accessible to everyone and the people who provide it become wealthier than football players? It will become super well, cheap to get education. Schools will drop in price. How are you going to be able to sell that anymore? But teachers, our level yeah. of education will be higher. Right? So teachers are going to lose their jobs. Schools are going to shut down. No, but learning the teachers and, won't lose their jobs. The teachers, the good well, teachers. Their pay will, will cut. No, but they'll be able to offset it with the new technology that allows them to monetize what they're doing. I think there'll be less teachers, but higher no. quality. No, no, no. There'll be more teachers, Peter. You're not thinking, you're not thinking fourth dimensionally, Marty. What happens is that the teachers won't have to focus on broad curriculums. They won't have to spend all day on, on okay, a broad topic. I, I no, get it. They'll be able to, so you're no, redefining what it means to be a teacher. Sorry? Yeah. You're going to redefine. The press didn't cause less books to be created. It caused more books to be created. The internet didn't cause less websites to be created. It caused more websites to be created. You yeah, but more there's more shit websites and more shit books. Yes, but it's more opportunities for everybody to create a website that's profitable for them because they don't need 10 million people. They just need a I, I agree. I, I agree, okay? I, I, I accept that there will be more people teaching things, but the nature of what it means to be a teacher 20 years ago will be different than what it means to be a teacher Absolutely. Uh, 10 years from now. So what we're really doing is redefining the word teacher. So it's not... It's not going to be the same. Just like the universities that charge a uh, hundred thousand uh, dollars for kids to go to university, those universities will no will be no more. There might be things called universities, but certainly not these privileged institutions that cost an arm and a leg to go yeah, to. Yeah, but I'm addressing this idea of this crash, right? Now we think of a crash in the in the in the markets as a bad thing because we saw what happened in global financial crisis, a dot com crash, crash of nineteen eighty seven, the crash of nineteen twenty nine, whatever. But those are not the those are not the types of those crashes didn't happen in fourth earnings, right? After a fourth earning, there's new systems that are that are set up, and mm -hmm. so what I'm saying, what I'm what I'm suggesting is that the the crash that will that will happen will be a cleansing crash, a welcome crash, as a bunch of other things crash up. Hey, bruh, okay? I don't know what kind of Christian uh, influence has corrupted your mind, but a cleansing fire that cleanses the earth so that heaven could be brought down is a freaking disaster for most no, of people, Peter, okay? So who do you I think do think there's going to be a market? cleansing crash, but it's going to be who? devastating for most people. No, who is going to get hurt? Who are the main people who are going to get hurt in the stock market when it crashes? Bruh, people right now who can't get jobs that pay them enough to work, they got to work three, four jobs in order to do that because they're being displaced by technology and AI and an algorithm. That's a cleansing fire you're talking about. No, that happens in an unraveling, in the third turning. 
what happens is that the 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 systems become ossified. The 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 gap between the rich and the poor gets um, spread because the previous generations took all the advantage, and there's none of that advantage from the bottom up. But that happens in a third turning. In a fourth turning, that becomes so untenuous that the crisis breaks that. And the new system allows for something better. So what will happen after the crisis if we get towards the golden age period isn't that we have all these people who are poor and then on the streets and people with social security and all that. What happens is that new systems are created. Peter, right now, right now, if someone were to move their, their, their funds from a um, uh, pension fund where they're not getting their 7 to 11% and they're barely getting 4% and they move that into a crypto fund, mm -hmm. they could be making 27% interest the year on assets going up 400 percent the yield what do they... the yield is there the, the the money that they need is there it's just that it, it needs to be taken from value new value that's going to be unlocked and the transition to that won't take 50 years bro what senior is gonna take their money out of their pension fund, which they don't have to. practically speaking, they don't have to. I get it. They the managers will do it. Right now, there's a, a new ETFs that came on the market that allows the trading of cryptocurrencies, right? Without having to buy the cryptocurrencies directly. Well, those things are now accessible to the pension funds. Don't you think that once that gets set up, then the corruption from the old system will seep into this bridge? Well, we don't have to worry about that. Uh, corruption will always seep in. That's what <laughs> happens from the first, second, and no, third No, no, no. Corruption is a human thing. And when yeah. we have AI and automation uh, making the decisions and creating things, then I don't think corruption has to seep into this new... I don't think we get to the golden age by keeping the level of corruption, the not the level of corruption, but the the nature of corruption will have to change for this new yeah. golden age because yeah, our ability to destroy the world is increasing year by year. There's no golden age that I can see happening where human beings are in charge of everything. Why? Because the problem with the planet is people, Tom. Look, I love no, no. people. You know that, right? You're thinking, you're thinking linearly. You're extrapolating literally. You're saying because of this is what happened in the past, this is what will happen in the future. No, 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 no. I'm talking about the fundamental flaw of human beings gets amplified with technology. You see this when it comes to social media, when it comes to these siloed networks. Yes, technology and social media does wonderful things, and I think we shouldn't abandon it. We should use it to great effect. The problem with these systems is the psychology of people. Tech stocks and ETFs don't change the psychology of a human being. No, Peter, I'm using those as small little examples. What I'm trying to, to, to get at is that there are syst uh, systemic changes that are occurring on a broad level on uh, in ways you can't predict. None of us can predict. That's what what's so exciting about this fourth turn, this fourth fourth turning at the end of the world. You know, it's if, ironic if that you're ever talking. Be anything... Go ahead. It's ironic that you're talking about not being able to predict things when that is literally what you're doing. No, so the what you can predict is that the unpredictable will will occur, but and the unpredictable will occur at a specific timing. That's what's so interesting about it. You don't know, you don't necessarily know the day that will be the coldest day of the year, but you know that the coldest day of the year is probably going to be between January and uh, and February. Yeah. So can I say I don't know how human beings are going to corrupt things, but I can predict definite they will corrupt things. I'm not arguing with that. I'm saying they will, even if it's. So how do we get to a golden age with corruption? Uh, uh, We've had do, multiple uh, golden ages on the planet, and human beings have been a part of all of them. Why can't we? This is what one? I think is going to happen, Tom, and this is what I think you're not able to see. <laughs> I think the nature of what it means to be a human being is going to change. Now, hopefully, it's not because of Neuralink, and we've become symbiotes with technology neural link okay huh? i'm on board i'm on board with that 
I would rather uh, a psychedelic revolution. I would rather a new discovery that changes our fundamental understanding of what it means to be in this universe. I'm looking to Nassim Haramin. I'm looking to aliens come from space. I'm looking for extra dimensional beings. I'm not looking for us to be Borg. All right. But I think if we don't fundamentally change what it means to be human, the next to transcend the human condition, then I don't see us entering a golden age. I see, I see us entering an apocalypse. In fact, I believe we're in a zombie apocalypse right now. I see it more and more every day. Human beings eating the brains of other human beings. And if we continue with this trend, the way it's going, I don't think we get to a golden age, Tom. Not with human beings. Well, that's very exciting, and it'll lead nicely to our next video next time where we talk <laughs> about uh, Terrence McKenna's Time Wave Zero and how I'm joining that with the fourth turning. Is this a joke? No. Oh, my God. Okay, let me write that down so we don't forget. <laughs> no, that's the, the next thing I want to talk about. All right, all right. You teased it, so we got to talk about it. Time. Well, we're really going back in the day, uh, Time Wave Zero. That's right. And the fourth turning. And the fourth turning. I can, sure, I can write. Um, okay, so I guess you want to wrap up now. I wanted to talk about. Um, well, that's nice, Peter. Like, where our generation, like, where are we in this whole? We're the millennial, the hero class. Yeah, we're the hero class. The millennials are a hero generation. And who's the and artist generation that comes after us? What age are they right now? They, uh, they're the kids who are, are now, who are zero to 20 years old now. Zero to 20. So you're 21 to 30. 41. 41? Wait, the, the millennials are 21 to 41. Oh, I right see. Now. Okay. So it's, not, right. a, so it's, it's Andrew, not a start yeah. thing. It's a, it's a range. I mean, I get it. it yeah. And, uh, all right, turning point finance. Okay, I, I I wanted to talk about how this. If we we heard about the fourth turning as it relates to finance, right? Stock market. Apparently, it's all the rage in the financial community to talk about the fourth turning. They know about this. They use it in order to predict the stock market to some degree. So sure. I wanted to talk yeah. about that. We don't have to talk about it now. We could talk about it later. And then I also wanted to talk about, like I think the solutions we have to aim for because part of what we why we want to talk about the fourth turning is that happy for a change we're engaged with the fourth turning like we care about this stuff we believe in this stuff and we want to help shape the future by implementing solutions crypto and and the like but happy i for don't a turning. that's right that's <laughs> that's right but i don't want government to be the thing we rely on and in fact part of what i want to do my mission is to get people Outside of this thinking of using government to fix our problems, no one because the boomers are in control of government and they don't seem to be, uh, you know, giving up that control very easily. Still, Peter, kind of stuck in that old mindset. You're speaking like a true hero. So you want to set up the new system. That's exactly what heroes do. It's great <laughs> that you're a, a quintessential example of your generation. So I want to ask you. Uh, well, we'll talk about this in the next video, but if you believe that government is where the solutions are, if we kind of have to meld government in with these other things, or will government the, the, will the government institutions be revolutionized? Like, will we use innovation to change the way we govern ourselves? Um, we've heard about governing protocols when it comes to crypto, uh, the voting rights that you get for holding tokens, things like that. So I wonder... How much government has to be mixed in here? Not that you know the answer for sure, but I'm interested in, in talking about that. If there's something that I think needs to change, it's definitely the way government functions. And I'm not sure if tinkering around the edges is possible to change that or is scrapping it and starting something new is the way to go forward. Maybe there are protocols or something in the crypto space that give us some insight. Maybe there were clues back in 2008 that showed us how this can uh, can work, but I am eager to figure out solutions that don't involve government.
this is too exciting. This is too fun. If you haven't read The Fourth Turning, read the book, listen to the audiobook. It's very easy to listen to the audiobook. If you're living in the United States or if you have any knowledge of the history of the United States, it's going to be even easier for you to listen to The Fourth Turning. If you don't know anything about the history of the U.S. or if you don't care about the U.S. at all, then it might be a little difficult for you to get through. But still, listen to the audiobook. It's not very long and it would be super useful. Just know there are many people, important people, who they really pay attention to the fourth turning in government, in finance, in uh, in other parts of the world, in other industries. They care about the fourth turning. So don't be the only person who hasn't read this book. That's my recommendation to you. If you want to continue watching this, if you haven't read it yet, definitely check out that book. Uh, audiobook is a, is a very good way of, of digesting that. It's not for nothing that uh, one of the most popular things in our generation is uh, Game of Thrones with the phrase, winter is coming. Somehow our global consciousness knows that we're headed towards a major change. Major change. Look, I'm for it. I am for it. Well, good, because it's going to happen anyway, Peter. It's going <laughs> to but you don't do you hear do you hear how you speak and we both speak exactly like the millennial cohort the hero generation cohort and it seems so natural to us but peter other generations and other kids speak completely differently and our children will speak completely differently too in fact it what's so interesting and we'll talk about this in one of the the, the later vision on the fourth fourth turning is that we have to prepare our kids for the things that they're going to have to deal with. They're going to have to deal with awakenings, unravels, and they're going to be around during the next fourth turning. We won't. And so we got to prepare them for that. And that's one of the things I'm really excited. I want Happy for Change to do something to help with the, the transition to the, to the, to, from the fourth to the, to the first turning now, but also to solve the problem for the next one. I would love it. If people in the next, uh, in my, as I'm dying, uh, people go, oh my God, Tom's uh, uh, knowledge, Tom and Peter's book or whatever is helping us <laughs> deal with this next thing. Or oh, the older generation is working with the younger generation, a la Hartmanism or whatever the hell they're going to come up with. <laughs> no Hartmanism. No, no. Hartmanism. It's going to be called Hartmanism. <laughs> Melissa, get on that. Uh, you know, the, the, just like you say, like these are broad categories and, you know, just because you are a certain age doesn't mean you necessarily have to fall just, into just that one point on that. Just one point on that. What matters is both because it's a it's a feedback mechanism. The situations affect the generation, and then the generation affects the situation because the, how they react to it matters. And so it's it's not just the what period you're uh, you're in, what turning, and not just what year you were born, it, and who your parents were. It's a mix of it all. So if you if you're if you're um, look at yourself specifically and go, well, what were my parents like? What was the generation that influenced them? What were the turning points? How old were they when certain things happened? And how old was I when 9-11 when happened, when the global financial crisis happened? How did it affect me? And how that, how you interacted with those events, how you saw those events will tell you where you are. You and I were in, in a good situation where we're cuspians. We're almost, um, uh, th we're almost Gen Xers and, al and, uh, and uh, millennials right in between. And the first cohort of a generation um, has a, a lot of strength, whereas the, the, middle, um, the, the middle one, uh, they're, 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 they're decidedly that type of generation. It was very interesting. I find it very interesting that we're able to have both views. You know, we remember the time where we have to go to the library to get information, and we remember, you know, having um, uh, looking on our iPhones for, for details. Whew. I'm also an Aries cusp like you. So, you know, I'm a water sign and a fire sign. <laughs> it's all really like cusps upon cusps upon cusps. It's perfect. <laughs> Tom, um, when I listen to John Stewart, who I am loving more and more now. I mean, I always love John Stewart, but my God, he sounds like a hero. No, it's like a, the more man. youthful in spirit you are, or maybe he's the, the wisdom, the elder wisdom. That's right. He That's seems... a boomer with wisdom helping the hero generation. That's what they're supposed to do. That's why it feels so good. But even boomers are not the only one. The Gen Xers and the, the generations, all three of the generations, so the... Um, the 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 silent the uh, artists and the nomads they're all supposed to help. So when you see um, uh, Jordan Peterson, uh, Brett Weinstein, Joe Rogan, why are we listening to these elder people? Because they Jack Ma, yeah, yeah. 
But now imagine if the entire generation were to work with, with the heroes in that way. That would Never gonna be happen. the amazing thing. Never going to happen. But we don't need them all to work with us. Uh, uh, the, the, the interesting thing about the resources that are now available to us compared to other generations is that our resources take into account, take into use the network effect. And so this even... I just watched the Lord of the Rings and one of the themes in the Lord of the Rings is that even the smallest, weakest character can change the world. And by God, isn't that the most true thing now than ever before? Now with the power of social media, with the power of technology, we can amplify the voices of even the smallest minority so that it doesn't really matter that there were fewer uh, uh, seniors fewer what's the generation again um boomers who are giving us wisdom their voice will be amplified like nobody's business and that's what gives me hope for the future that we need less and less people now to change the world because we're all including those minorities amplified like never before Oh, we We've said got a great Ashley foundation, Peter. Here. There's such exciting things coming up. We haven't even touched on the charismatic leader who extends the the third turn in and uh, gives more uh, gives us more time in order to get the fourth turn in going. We haven't talked about the great champion that leads the uh, the, the the boomer who leads the uh, the hero generation into solving the problem. We haven't even talked about the Noah effect and the Joseph effect and how volatility can cause these these random things to occur. These Frodo like. Uh, situations it's it's amazing there's so many interesting things to digest there ashley says winter is coming freaking epic definitely and uh, she also says david versus goliath right david the little guy the vocal minority has a serious shot at winning against a huge but unwieldy foe actually let me tell you this all right and uh, maybe we'll, we'll end it on this because we'll, we'll never stop an hour and six minutes it's crazy um Listen to a talk, a TED talk that Malcolm Gladwell gave. It's called, um, it's something about David and Goliath. I'll share it in the Jumpstart group. It's very fascinating where he explains, right. spoiler alert, that David was actually not the underdog. That David was actually more powerful than Goliath because he used... No, no, don't a, give all that. It's such a great story. It's you gotta such a let great people, story. Yeah, people have That's to right. hear it. And there is a book that Malcolm Gladwell wrote called Goliath, I believe, and he he expounds on this idea. But sometimes who we perceive as the underdog is not the underdog, but it's the person who is the most likely to accomplish the mission. Just like in The Lord of the Rings, it's not that Frodo was the underdog. It's that the Hobbit folk were the creatures who were the most likely to be able to succeed, whereas Gandalf and Galadriel and Aragorn we're all much more likely to be overwhelmed by the corrupting influence of the ring, whereas the lesser, humble, lower-class hobbits were more likely to succeed by virtue of them being small and not Same powerful. Same thing as the kids in Harry Potter. It's the children who are able to succeed, the hero generation. Peter... You got to write on that piece of paper the intransigent, uh, intransigent minority. This is something that Nassim Taleb talks about in the Insertal series, which I recommend. It's mandatory reading for everybody. Um, and this idea that it's the uh, the uh, the intransigent minority is the one who sets the tone. If there's a group of people that you need to cater to that will not change their mind under any circumstances, they are the most powerful. And what do we have in the crypto space? The maximalists. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Ashley's very excited here. Um, yes, power is all in the details. Um, and she also says, um, let me see here. Uh, fantastic <laughs> analysis, men folk. Oh, <laughs> I like that. Uh, oh, and if, hey, maybe we can get this sister ship. I don't know if they're interested in it, but uh, if you haven't watched the Sistership podcast, it's a very fun podcast to watch. They talk about a lot of things. Uh, they're both very intelligent, very bright. Maybe they'll talk about the first turning in the next one, but you can check their podcast. What is it? Every Thursday? Every Thursday. That's right. So you can listen to the women folk and their fantastic the analysis. On YouTube too. and on Twitch. It's fantastic. It's really good. The Sistership. Awesome. 
Tom, this was a lot of fun. Uh, we could talk. We could definitely talk for another hour or two. I yeah, know yeah. that for a fact. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but we'll come back maybe tomorrow, uh, but soon, and we'll talk more about the fourth turning. If you're watching this and you're interested, uh, leave your comments, questions, anything down below. We're very interested in hearing what you have to say. This is not a one-way conversation. We really want to hear from anybody who's searching this, who's finding this. We really want to hear from you what you're thinking, how you're viewing the future, what solutions uh, you're paying attention to, because this is a collaboration collaborative uh, mission. This is a collective endeavor that we're all on. This is not one person. It's not one hero. We are all part of making this change possible. So if you like this, check us out on Happy for a Change, facebook.com slash happy for a change. You can join the Happy for Change audience that's there. If you want to interact with us more directly, you can join our Telegram or Discord. You can find those links down below. But head over to patreon.com slash happy for a change and become a patron and help Happy for a Change. Help us to produce more of this content content to enact more solutions to unlock the future because the future is ours if we're willing to fight for it tom thank you it's the fourth turning ho ho <laughs> awesome anything else if uh, people want to uh, have conversations about different types of investments that you can do around the fourth turning and really take advantage of the types of uh, crisis and apocalypse or golden age that we're talking about, uh, that's information. I would love to you know have chats like that on our Jumpstart, uh, sorry, on our Telegram group and on Discord. So, uh, but that's really for people who are subscribing to our Patreon. So go to patreoncom slash happy for change and uh, we'll be there in your pocket. Have these uh, great conversations. Love it. Take care, everybody. Thanks. Ciao. Bye.